This is The Enragé, a show where we take a deeper dive into written works published at the Center for a Stateless Society. Join us as we give voice to the ideas challenging the vain phantoms that haunt our social reality and stand in the way of total liberation. For more information, visit c4ss.org. And to support this show or any of the other projects happening at the center, please visit patreon.com slash c4ss.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the very first episode of The Ombrogé. I'm your host, Joel Williamson. You may know me from another show I host called The Non-Servian Podcast. And while you can definitely count on us continuing everything we do at non Media, you can also expect to hear me here as well. I'm a longtime admirer of C4SS, and I am honored to collaborate with them at this level. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. Our guest today is Kevin Carson. Kevin Carson is a senior fellow of the Center for a Stateless Society and holds the Center's Carl Hess Chair in Social Theory. He's an anarchist without adjectives, heavily influenced by autonomism and the new municipalist movements. His written work includes Studies in Mutualist Political Economy, Organization Theory, A Libertarian Perspective, The Homebrew Industrial Revolution, A Low Overhead Manifesto, and The Desktop Regulatory State, all of which are freely available online. His book, Exodus, General Idea of the Revolution in the 21st Century, is forthcoming. Carson has also written for such print publications as The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, and a variety of internet-based journals and blogs including Just Things, The Art of the Possible, as well as his own blogs, Mutualist Blog, and T. Earl Grey Hot. Today we'll be discussing Kevin's new article titled The Myth of the Private Sector, Part 1, Why Big, Small, and Vertical Horizontal Trumps Public-Private. Kevin Carson, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Before we start dissecting some of the ideas within your article, I wanted to ask you sort of a broader question. You produce so much content. Why are you interested in making the world a better place? Uh, I guess for the same reason anyone does. I don't know uh, how much of me, if any, will continue after I'm dead. So I kind of like to think of the world as a going concern that will continue after I'm gone. And uh, if anything gives me hope for the future, the idea that my existence uh, had any meaning, it's that uh, the world will keep going on a better basis. For sure. I guess before we start actually dissecting different aspects of this article, why don't you give the audience a brief rundown of what this piece is all about as well as what inspired you to write it? Well, uh, among right libertarians, uh, I guess what you would just call movement libertarianism in the United States, it's just standard framing to contrast the so-called private sector with the so-called public sector and talk about the, the private sector being good or being efficient or whatever and the public sector being bad. And I think that's uh, fundamentally misleading or um, a distortion in a system where there's so much interconnection between large corporations and between the state and the state has had so much of a role in creating and maintaining capitalism and there's so much similarity in organizational style between the large bureaucratic corporation and the bureaucratic state and their their authoritarianism and their use of hierarchy to benefit those at the top at the expense of those they manage. At one point in the article, you point out how the public sector post office is better than the, quote, private sector UPS at making use of what Frederick Hayek called the distributed or situational knowledge of its workers. Can you expound on what Hayek means by that and also why this knowledge is essential for efficiency? I think the closest thing uh, Hayek referred to himself in uh, in that essay, the, the use of uses of knowledge in society was the difference in productivity based on someone's direct knowledge of uh, 
what would happen when you reposition a machine in the production process or something like that. Although I, I think he was probably, uh, he probably had uh, something like a shop foreman in mind more than an ordinary production worker. Uh, but it's uh, uh, the same theme that we've seen in David Graver talking about uh, tacit knowledge or, or Metis. David Noble's book, Forces of Production, where he wrote about uh, attempts to de-skill labor and uh, shift direct control of production from the shop floor up, up to managerial hierarchies and engineers, uh, where he said that that actually resulted in the production process being even more vulnerable to interference by workers or sabotage by workers because these super expensive, large-scale CNC machines that were introduced into industry in the late 40s and, and the, the 50s, still uh, required an, an awful lot of, of the knowledge by the people who operated them. And when workers got pissed off at management, the scrap rate went through the roof because of it. And, you know, you see the same thing uh, with the wobbly tactic of uh, working to rule. Any Anytime workers say, okay, you you management geniuses know everything uh, and we're just here to shut up and do what we're told. Uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to stop contributing any knowledge we have or taking any initiative at all. We're going to follow every rule you set to the letter because you guys know best. And that's about the most devilishly effective way to sabotage production ever known. And just generally speaking, it's the direct production workers knowledge of the process that makes the biggest difference in productivity. Right. When I think of a monopoly on delivery service, the USPS immediately comes to my mind. I know less about how UPS and FedEx have managed to capture an artificial amount of market share. Can you explain how that happened? Well, I honestly don't know much uh, about the history of those companies. I think part of it is just the extent to which the centralized trunk infrastructure processing machinery and the large scale shipping uh, facilities along the main trunk lines are a, a natural monopoly that really are uneconomical to duplicate too many times. Other than that, I uh, would assume uh, things like Intellectual property, path dependency, other similar things have something to do with it. Right, right. And on that note, in the article, you write that the profit model of, of big business and to a lesser but significant extent that of capital as a whole is directly dependent on the state. Can you explain what you mean by capital here and also how it's dependent on the state? Well, by capital, I, I uh, just mean the uh, property and the means of production that's been accumulated over the generations so that it's concentrated in a relatively small number of hands compared to the number of workers who are competing for jobs and the separation of ownership of the means of production from labor dating back to the primitive accumulation in the early modern period, the enclosures of the, of the commons and the other land expropriations and nullification of the peasantry's traditional tenure and land and, and so forth that basically created the wage system by evicting the majority of agricultural laborers from the land or turning them into tenants at will who had to work for wages in order to live. The way capital is dependent on, on the state, in part, it's, it's because of the legacy of this primitive accumulation and the role of the state in ongoing enforcement of it, uh, enforcing titles to inherited stolen property uh, on, on the part of the heirs or assigns of the enclosers. It's the state's enforcement of other legal monopolies like uh, monopoly on the supply of credit and liquidity, absentee title to enclosed land and natural resources, intellectual property, and so forth that artificially restrict the number of employers competing for labor and increase the number of 
competing laborers relative to employers so that the labor market is a buyer's market rather than a seller's market and workers get less than their net product as a wage. Capital is dependent on the state for its ongoing efforts to provide access to artificially cheap resource inputs through wars for oil or uh, national security policies that prop up friendly regimes overseas that guarantee access to natural resources and raw materials that keep labor cheap, uh, the use of international intellectual property accords that enable corporations that don't actually produce anything to maintain a legal monopoly on disposing of commodities produced via outsourced production in sweatshops, socialized costs in general, the provision of subsidized infrastructures and other production inputs, uh, direct subsidies of all sorts, uh, the role of the state in limiting or suppressing labor organization. The central role of the state basically is to restrain production among capitalist corporations and subsidize their production in inputs and socialize risks and costs. Right, right. Yeah. And I know that, you know, we could probably uh, dedicate an entire podcast on that question alone, since that's sort of a central focus of a lot of your work. Yeah, I think it was the third chapter of uh, my book, Organization Theory, that went into all the details of uh, big businesses' dependence on, on the state for anyone that wants to look further into that. Awesome. Good plug. In the article, you seem to imply that the United States Postal Service is and correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to imply that the United States Postal Service is more decentralized, self-managed, and less bureaucratic than its capitalist competitors. Can you explain how that works? Well, in the article, I was talking primarily about their last mile network, people directly engaged in delivery. I don't know how much more decentralized or horizontal it is above that level at, you know, the... Uh, mail processing or regional distribution levels. But I think one thing that contributed uh, at the local level to its superior efficiency is just the fact that they've got a dedicated workforce of people with job, t uh, job security and seniority who've been working the same routes for years and uh, know them forwards and backwards and have just the basic knowledge and context it, it takes to use judgment. Whereas the uh, UPS and FedEx workforces, there are much more thinly dispersed number of people operating much larger routes, and they're much more dependent on the company for information using things like, uh, you know, on onboard GPS to find the delivery site they're looking for and that sort of thing. Also, to some extent, I think... Uh, the fact that uh, the post office is heavily unionized, I know that'll really uh, push some right libertarians up over the edge. But if you look at stuff that Postmaster DeJoy was doing to try to sabotage mail delivery capability and cause delays through most of last year, it was the postal workers unions that played a, a primary role in fighting that in some cases taking back the processing machines and reassembling them against direct orders uh, in defiance of, of DeJoy and, and things like that, or threatening to shut down distribution centers if they didn't stop dismantling and, and removing machines. So I think just the fact that the workers who have the knowledge actually have more ability to fight back in the post office probably has a beneficial effect. At the beginning of the article, you point out how clunky software such as Blackboard, Canvas, and Moodle are forced on captive clientele of employees. What's the process by which these undesirable softwares are adopted? Well, it's uh, generally done, I think, in uh, IT departments that are totally stovepiped from any direct feedback from the workers who use it. But that's pretty much the way corporations do everything. That's the way the R&D process works in general. It's uh, just about every every product out there to a large extent that's used by workers is 
produced in one corporate bureaucracy by a, a stovepiped R&D uh, department, and it's it's designed to be sold directly to a stovepiped procurement department in a different corporation. Hey, real, real quick, Kevin, if you don't mind, I didn't get the opportunity to look up what you meant by stovepiped. What does that mean? It means it's like a, a, a siloed, it's a completely separate bureaucracy that's isolated from feedback from other departments. Okay. Uh, there's, I think it was the, uh, it was Milton Friedman who came up with the distinction. It was a uh, quadrant of efficiency based on whether someone was spending their own money or spending the, uh, someone else's money and whether they were spending it on themselves or they were spending it on someone else. And all of the uh, major actors involved in designing software, procuring it and getting to getting it to the people who use it are spending other people's money on something to be used by other people with the people who actually use it never having any say in the process at any point. And it's not like somebody's going to quit their job because the productivity software they're forced to use is, is unacceptable. At least it's, it's pretty unlikely they're going to. And the people working in the corporation are definitely not going to be given an opportunity to, to vote up or down on it or say, no, I think I'd rather use this. I'm going to use this utility instead. They have no choice. So there's really not much incentive to, to even check whether it works for them. I once had a job in telecommunications that used clunky software. And I always figured they were able to continue using it because they weren't really subject to the laws of supply and demand that would occur in an environment that was actually competitive. Yeah. I also feel like most people experience these frustrations without even understanding why it's like that. I think that that's true. And it, the problem is made worse by the fact that generally in most industries, there's just a handful of corporations that all share the same organizational culture and they buy the same productivity software from the same corporation. So there's really no competition between them that would enable employees to make a meaningful choice anyway. In that sense, even as consumers, uh, we're all, at least to some extent, part of a captive clientele for the same reason, because the products that are sold are generally limited to a relatively small number of models produced by a handful of corporations that all have the same cultures and rely on intellectual property to restrict competition. Roderick Long wrote of the viability of public property in the 90s. How might your conception of non-statist versions of public property differ from his, if at all? Well, I, I can't say for certain that they do. If they did, I suppose it would be just in the extent to which I advocate common property as the norm in things like uh, land ownership through Ostromite, natural resource commons, and uh, community land trusts, and so forth. And the extent to which I see private property and land as being an anomaly established by the state in early modern times. I think Roderick might see common property as something that's legitimate, but primarily a supplement to log in individual private property rather than being the primary norm. Although I, you know, I can't say for sure that that's the case. Mm -hmm. Is this difference in each of your outlook predictive or is it more based on what it is that we who seek a free society should be promoting? Uh, it's hard for me to draw a line between it because well, for one thing, I'm uh, I'm more a consequentialist than a deontologist. I tend to favor things based on how they would promote uh, felt or experienced freedom and agency and reduce uh, experienced constraint rather than based on whether they can be logically deduced from formal principles like self-ownership and non-aggression. So to the extent that the large hierarchical organizations and being subject to bosses or managers or state officials or anyone else in a, in a position of authority is a 
felt constraint that reduces one's experienced sense of autonomy, I oppose them regardless of, of uh, whether a right libertarian would consider them formally voluntary or not. I also, I think it's partly just a, a matter of factual uh, interpretation of the past, the extent to which I see existing capitalist institutions being the pr- product of a large-scale force, because I'm heavily influenced by Graeber and other radical historians who question all of the, the just-so stories and uh, capitalist nursery fables and uh, so on about the, the origins of current institutions. For example, the just so story about the origin of property through homesteading and admixture of labor and and so forth being the norm or, or the use of specie currency being something that just spontaneously emerged through barter giving rise to the problem of, of mutual coincidence of wants or or the cash nexus becoming dominant because of some natural human propensity to truck barter and exchange and all that. I agree with the people who see the foundation of capitalism in the early modern period, the suppression of the commons, the imposition of the cash nexus and the money economy and so on as being the result of uh, large-scale acts of violence. I think we had what amounted to a libertarian communist society and economy operating at the village level through the open field system, common pasture, and uh, all of that. And it was suppressed through the use of state violence and in alliance with the big landlords and capitalists on a, a level that was absolutely totalitarian. Your use of the word large is obviously a relative term. How do we understand the actual size of a firm when you refer to it as large? Well, generally, I would be referring to, you know, what's conventionally considered an oligopoly firm where you've got a small enough number of firms in a given industry that they can follow a price leader system and where the the individual firm is large enough that the people engaged in various forms of activity are almost completely out of touch with each other and only connected by the common management. Mm hmm. Well, let's let's dive into that a little bit. Um, a similar question could be raised about the vertical horizontal distinction, right? There's a world of a structural difference between a workers' cooperative and a hierarchical corporate model, right? But uh, yeah, to some extent. Um, but I think it's also functional. I think. I'm not sure where you draw the line, but I think a small firm is able to, or a small organization. At some point, it's small enough to function holoptically, that is, where everyone in the organization is to some extent aware of the whole process and sees it holistically so that the different people engaged in different activities are able to function as a unit in direct awareness of each other rather than their relations with each other being mediated bureaucratically. If you look at something like the Mondragon system, it's obviously moved pretty far into the vertical realm because it's it's got a bunch of uh, small shops that are more or less self-managed, but they're still subject to, to some extent, to the uh, managerial authority and to the control over finances of the umbrella system. Mm-hmm. So how, how do we meaningfully draw the line then between hierarchy and, and horizontalism? Well, I'm not sure you can draw a uh, hard and fast line at any point. I think uh, the most important thing is to uh, break up the largest concentrations into something smaller and push everything in the direction of decentralism and, and horizontalism as much as it's feasible to do. And to the extent that a more vertical organization is necessary for technical reasons, you keep it to the the minimum possible. If large hierarchical firms are are so inefficient, why are they able to dominate within the current economy? They're inefficient in terms of absolute efficiency, you know, things like the ratio of output to input, but they're the most efficient at adapting to a fundamentally perverse ecosystem. Uh, They're 
for all kinds of structural incentives and structural effects that favor that form of organization and protect them against the consequences of their own inefficiency. We discussed some of them uh, earlier, things like entry barriers, restraints like intellectual property that damp down competition and restrict them from the the ill competitive effects of their inefficiency, subsidies to their excessive operating costs. They're successful in this economy for the same reason that a planned economy and state-owned enterprises were able to survive in the Soviet Union because you had a system that selected for them. Right, right. So that, that begs the question then, what's the relationship between the size and the structure of a firm? Do these two factors facilitate one another? And if so, in what specific manner? I guess that gets back to our earlier discussion of uh, what I, I mean by a large firm. And that, you know, the, the size itself was to some extent uh, identified by its uh, structural description. The larger it is, the more you have bureaucratic differentiation between departments that only have mediated communication with each other through bureaucratic intermediaries. And the the more things approach this model, the more everyone's actions are constrained by Taylorist best practices or by Bavarian job descriptions and the less discretion there is for individual actors to use their own distributed knowledge or their own initiative. Right. How, I wonder how actually existing examples of the contrary fits into what you're saying, such as small vertical firms or large horizontal firms. How, how do you make sense of those? Well, just right off the top of my head, I can't think of any small vertical firms, although, you know, I I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if there were any, but thinking of large, large horizontal firms, I I can't think of the actual uh, names uh, right now. They're aware there there have been a lot of experiments with things like the Wikified firm and and similar models of organization that try to eliminate hierarchy as much as possible. And I, I guess I would see them as something that's laudable and mainly uh, maybe reflective of of, uh, large firms being pressed in a certain direction, trying to survive the transition from hierarchy to networks that we're undergoing. And, uh, you know, it might be successful to some extent. There might be some small number of corporations that manage to survive the transition and take on a fundamentally different character. But I think in most cases where this kind of thing happens, you know, all of the uh, the fads that Tom Peters celebrated back in the 90s, for instance, it's usually trying to simulate horizontal organization pretty ineffectively within a vertical organization. It's trying to put new wine in, into old bottles. You wind up, no matter how good the intentions of the people that come up with these programs and try to implement them, they wind up being being sabotaged by their own organization. And it's not just in the the private sector. I'm thinking of uh, fourth generational warfare and networked uh, warfare models that the Army has tried to uh, implement over the last 20 years, taking advantage of new network communication technology to allow lower level uh, tactical commanders to communicate directly with one another and use their own initiative. Uh, And it's wound up being sabotaged every step of the way by field grade officers and by general officers who've actually taken advantage of the new network communications to increase the number of approvals that are required before anybody can do anything to the point that for a mission proposal to be accepted, uh, it has to be presented in the correct PowerPoint format. You know, it's possible that I could I could be using vertical in a different way or that I'm I'm not fully understanding what you mean by vertical, but what what I'm referring to when I say small vertical is say like the donut shop down the street that has owners and employees. You know, the employees have strict schedules, they don't really innovate within the firm. They just show up for their job, you know, and run a register 
and do whatever their bosses tell them to do. Is that okay? I understand. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I think to uh, a large extent, that's that's facilitated by just some of the basic things uh, we talked about earlier. The um, imbalance of, of bargaining power between labor and capital, and the fact that they're dependent on jobs in an industry that's primarily dominated by brick and mortar restaurants, coffee shops, or or whatever. Also, the fact that uh, for a lot of structural reasons, the restaurant and coffee shop hospitality industry are dominated by corporate chains with pretty authoritarian franchise models. And there are a lot of things that artificially create entry barriers and artificially increase the size of even downtown brick and mortar establishments and put difficulties in the way of, of exit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So another related question, how is it that horizontal organizations would be more efficient since they're seemingly more complex than, say, dictatorships, right? They seem to provide more dignity for labor, but what is it about horizontality that gives them a competitive advantage? Well, they might be more complex, but they're not more complicated. Uh, If anything, uh, bureaucratic hierarchy is more complicated simply because more communication is required to do anything. You've got to get everybody on the same page and get it centrally approved by the bureaucracy before anyone can do anything. On the other hand, a horizontal organization is governed by the same stigmergic coordination model as oh, uh, Linux software development or Wikipedia, where there is no central coordinator. It's essentially a permissionless network where the people engaged in a particular activity are using their own direct judgment of the situation. And the fact that it is permissionless means that people can directly react to the situation very quickly instead of waiting for permission from someone else, and they can use their own best judgment about how to react without having to have their judgment filtered through a bunch of company policies and best practices that were created by an absentee management that's afraid to trust them with their own initiative. This is sort of related to the question I I asked before. Uh, A standard right libertarian objection to your piece might be that a private hierarchical institution, regardless of their efficiency, are more ethical than any status institution because they're voluntary. What would be your response to that? Well, in in printable language, I guess uh, I I would say I've I've had some really, really bad history of toxic interactions with anyone on social media that uses the voluntarist self-designation. And just as a very broad generalization about all of them, I would say that their concept of what distinguishes voluntary from coercive takes absolutely no cognizance whatsoever of background conditions or background levels of coercion. If one party to a direct transaction isn't actually holding a gun to the other party's head, they call it voluntary. And it's it's just really stupid, in my opinion. We're talking about an entire system that was established by force and is maintained by force through its its basic legal operating rules. I mean, you don't you don't have to have a cop standing right there with a gun for it to be coercive when The basic distribution of property itself uh, reflects past robbery on a massive scale where the system of property distribution is maintained on an ongoing basis through state enforcement to titles uh, by state judiciary and and so on. And uh, where there are things like intellectual property or the Taft-Hartley Act or massive state subsidies to corporate operating costs or entry barriers that restrict competition, the the entire system is permeated by coercion. I mean, you might as well tell one of these people that the U.S. Post Office is just hunky-dory and completely voluntary because nobody puts a gun to their head and forces them to buy stamps to send a first-class letter. It's an incredibly stupid argument. I'm sorry. (laughs) 
the people just royally piss me off. <laughs> I've just seen so many fucking times. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know if, if you've got any kind of a ban on the seven words or whatever here, but I've seen it so many times on social media that anyone who complains about what it's like to work at a corporation, there will be all of yeah. these shitheads <laughs> with the uh, black and gold abbeys yeah. and uh, the word voluntarist. <laughs> And their bios jumping in to say, well, if you don't like it, go work somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like to stomp them into the ground, man. They're fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's it's beyond frustrating. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I think I I sort of started out there. <laughs> well, everybody's, everybody comes from somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so moving on, as you know, Noam Chomsky's approach is that the burden of proof necessarily rests in the hands of the person or institution claiming authority, and that they are always illegitimate by default unless they can prove otherwise. If they can't prove it, then they must be dismantled. How might this ethical framing, if at all, relate to your insights on the relationship between horizontality and efficiency? I would probably not uh, have a whole lot to add to that other than just I generally agree. Anytime you've got someone uh, wearing a necktie and sitting behind a desk telling them what to do, the proper response should just be who died and left you in charge. Yeah. Yeah, and I know that you were saying earlier that your ethics are a bit more consequentialist. But regardless, do you see the goal as both to meet these ethical standards and to promote an organizational style that facilitates or fosters efficiency? Uh, I would say, yeah. I mean, I don't see, I see them as pretty much mutually reinforcing goals. Just by definition, anything that leaves dis discretionary authority to those affected by something and, and who are directly involved in the process will increase efficiency. And anything that gives authority to people that don't suffer the consequences of their own decisions or who aren't in direct contact with the situation results in inefficiency. Okay. So before we go into some listener questions that we have for you, I wanted to ask you a fun question. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if Lysander Spooner were alive, he probably wouldn't appreciate you saying anything nice about the United States Postal Service. How do, you, how do you think he'd respond to this article? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, my reaction to Spooner in general is, I mean, he had did a lot of valuable work and had some legitimate things to say, but he's by far the uh, right libertarian's favorite uh, individualist anarchists, anarchist, and I think it's probably for a lot of uh, cultural reasons uh, other, than, other than that, I'd respond that his model of a private postal service, which, you know, I haven't read a whole lot about, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are a lot of fallacy of composition issues involved in uh, how that would be scaled up to completely replacing a larger system and whether it could be done and uh, just to what extent the function itself is a, a natural monopoly or at least a natural oligopoly so that it would make more sense to take over the existing system and reorganize it along libertarian socialist organizational principles, turning it into some sort of a stakeholder cooperative that's uh, internally self-managed or something rather than out-compete it from outside. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I did read in preparation for this interview that the small amount of competition that he did experiment with resulted in like significantly cheaper prices for their stamps and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know if you, you're familiar. I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm just, I just don't know enough about details like uh, what his particular market was and how they differed from the predominant uh, types of customers of the post office, uh, whether they were... Mm -hmm a niche market with some special distinguishing characteristic that he was able to serve more effectively than he might have been able to serve other people and that that sort of thing. That's what I mean when I raise the the fallacy of composition questions about it. I 
I just don't know. Mm -hmm. But just in general, uh, anytime I've seen any discussion of, of a privatization model of uh, previously public organizations, there winds up being all sorts of hidden factors that, that show up, you know, like the privatization of utilities, uh, the electrical in industry in California, where it, it turns out that uh, you've, you've got all of these different so-called private uh, utility companies that are actually just basically marketing companies with different letterheads that are using the same underlying physical infrastructure. Hmm. So, I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to read more about uh, Spooner's actual uh, mail service to say any more than that. Those are just my reasons for being uh, skeptical. Okay. So here are some listener questions. So we know that you don't call yourself a mutualist anymore. Uh, you're more sympathetic to anarchists without adjectives. But this listener asks, what's the best way to communicate market anarchist or mutualist ideas to centrists who don't have economic backgrounds? I would uh, recommend the old standby Tucker state socialism and anarchism uh, for one thing. And I hate to toot my own horn, but I wrote an article uh, on market anarchism for, I forget what anthology it was. It just came out. Gary Chartier posted about it on Facebook, but I can't remember if it's Rutledge or, or some other public. Oh, the Rutledge Handbook of Anarchy? Yeah, yeah. I, I did a, an article on market anarchism for them, and I mean, I don't really make any any uh, original ar arguments for market anarchism myself in, in the article, but I quote a lot of really good arguments from people like Tucker, Thomas Hodgkin, Franz Oppenheimer, and uh, and people like that, uh, that I would I would recommend those people themselves as good sources for inter introducing a centrist to market anarchism, but generally uh, the things they have to say about it are, are spread out through a whole lot of reading, and I I distilled them down into a fairly small number of block quotes that you can read pretty quickly. So if, if you wanted to introduce someone to what those people had to say about it, my article might be one handy way to do it. There you go. Cool. Second listener question is, what's your favorite fish to fry? Well, I don't really, uh, I'm not really good at frying meat, you know, with breading on it or, or whatever, uh, managing this the skillet temperature or whatever it takes. I actually do something like saute salmon or, or uh, roast some fish in the oven, but in restaurants, I really like catfish and cod fried. Either, you know, one of those all-you-can-eat catfish places or uh, fried cod at a fish and chips place. All right. All right. Okay. So the last listener question is, you seem to blend points of both the left and right libertarian tradition. Is this a point of rhetoric or a philosophical one? Um, I would say even that when I... Back in the day, uh, it, it was more true back when I wrote uh, Mutualist Political Economy and maybe through, you know, around 2010, where I at least appealed to right libertarians uh, a lot more than I do at present. But even then, I don't think I think I was not so much uh, blending points of view from the libertarian right and with my arguments at the time as I was trying to frame my own generally left-wing perspective in language that would make it uh, appealing or identifiable to people on the right who might want to cross over, uh, just, you know, trying to frame it in their terms or using their language. There's never really been a time uh, since I became an anarchist when I actually identified with the right, but I was probably a lot more patient and a lot more willing to define things in their terms then than I am now. Moving towards the actual end of our conversation here, can you give any hints or insights about what the myth of the private sector two might be all about and when it's coming out? Uh, well, I'm not sure when it will come out. I'd, I would just guess, you know, sometime in the next month or, or two anyway. But what it will be about is uh, something I think we discussed uh, under the heading of uh, some of the other 
questions about how the whole idea of private sector competition is largely a myth uh, because of industries being dominated by a handful of firms that sh all share the same organizational culture so that they're only really pretending to compete. Uh, the big go-to example I always use just from personal experience, the, the hospital corporation I work for is, is uh, Community Health Systems. And at, at the time I quit, it was the second largest hospital chain in the country after Columbia HCA. It may actually be, be the, uh, the biggest now. It may have surpassed Columbia since it absorbed some some other, like I think the third the third largest corporation. But in any case, the two companies are both headquartered in the greater Nashville area. They both share inside directors and uh, vice presidents that are just constantly reshuffled back and forth between the two corporations. They share the same toxic organizational culture of, of buying up local community nonprofit hospitals and then just completely uh, strip mining them, uh, gutting their staffing levels and uh, pocketing the savings as profit. Their senior management live in the same community. They probably all attend the same country clubs, probably went to the same B schools, go to the same big box Baptist church and uh, all have the same call girls, so there's really no competition. It's more just uh, managed competition where they both follow the same price leader system without requiring any direct collusion to actually illegally set the, the prices. And, you know, they hire the same Studer Group consultants to impose the same scripting on their workers. So, you know, they're just a, a couple of corporations that uh, dominate the the national market with administered pricing and passing whatever their costs are to the consumers and uh, collecting a pretty much guaranteed profit to uh, mark up on a cost plus basis without any significant price competition between them and no significant difference in their organizational culture that would have any competitive effect. And I think that's true in most industries. You've got a bunch of capitalist corporations competing with each, uh, pretending to compete with each other and uh, doing a lot of poor mouthing about, the, oh, God, this cutthroat competitive global marketplace we're in, that we've just got to cut labor costs or we'll, we'll go under. And it's actually only their workers that are competing with each other. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, if you don't like the American dream, Kevin, you can move to a different country. <laughs> well, I guess those people in 1776 should have moved to a different country instead of overthrowing their own legitimate government then, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't the king of England they were fighting. It was their own uh, royal charter governments that, uh, uh -huh. that were the law of the land. You know? Yeah, yeah. Governor Hutchinson in uh, Massachusetts. Wow, wow. All right. Well, what are some resources uh, our listeners should check out if they want to learn more about everything that we've discussed today? I suppose just in, in terms of business organization, organizational structure, the two most recent things I, I published were Homebrew Industrial Revolution and Desktop Regulatory State that they have a lot to say about horizontal versus vertical organization maybe organization theory also that went into some of the same things. God, other than that, I don't, I don't remember a whole a lot of what I've written just as far as individual op-ed pieces and occasional writing. All right. Well, is there anything I forgot to ask you that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? Well, I should have a, a forthcoming book before too long. I've pretty much completed the text and I'm just working with uh, Gary Chartier who, uh, always does an amazing job formatting things for publication. So I'm, I'm guessing within the next couple of months, it should be available at Amazon. If nothing goes wrong. Great, great. And the name of that book? It's uh, called Exodus, General Idea of the Revolution in the 21st Century. And the online manuscript is available at exodus875.wordpress.com. Cool. Well, I know we're all looking forward to reading that. 
Kevin, this has been um, very insightful, and I really appreciate you coming on today. Well, thanks a lot for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, well, uh, good luck out there, and hopefully we'll talk to you very soon. Cool. Thanks. All right, for sure. Bye. Bye.